Two of the greatest directors in Hollywood were Cecil B. DeMille and Eric von Stroheim. Both autocrats. One worked with the studio system, the other against it. One immediately saw, I think, that to be different than other directors would be to his benefit. He threw tantrums all the time. This is supposed to be war! Death, hell, destruction! Not us, and this good picnic! I'm making this picture for the theater, not for the actors! Quiet, quiet, quiet! We're trying to take a scene here. We've got 4,000 people on this set. Now keep quiet and attend to your business. that girl doing over there with a 1935 headdress? You know, this isn't a fantasy, this is history. If he could find some little thing to, to pick on, some little something, and if there were enough guests around, he used to deliver a lecture. And some of DeMille's early lectures were, <laughs> were really something. We comb the museums of the world. We scour every library there is to get accurate and authentic detail. And they give me a girl that looks as though she'd just walked out of a beauty salon. The name of Cecil B. DeMille, said his advertisement, is written in letters of fire and gold across the entire history of motion pictures. I think he gave God top place, but right under that. Mr. DeMille. He was a very fine director. Cecil B. DeMille mounted the greatest show on earth. Demanding absolute loyalty from his staff, he directed as though chosen by God for this one task. C.B. himself, I think, was thoroughly and totally and completely detested by everyone who ever worked for him until they got to know him. He was the king. He, he, ran, a, he ran the studio. He ran his own. He, he was the one that made all the pictures that made the money. And he was an autocrat, but I guess he deserved to be. If I am ruthless, said DeMille, I am ruthless for the sake of work in which I and hundreds of others have put time, money, thought, and labor, which I will not see jeopardized by the carelessness of any one individual. He insisted that everything be absolutely 100% perfect. And if it wasn't 100% perfect, you could hear from DeMille. I saw him directing, and he had the most tremendous energy of anyone I've ever known. He was himself so tremendously. He was a bull, a young bull. And he always, I always feel, felt I had to give an absolute reason for being a woman, for being alive, for being there, for occupying airspace. 
Cecil B. DeMille began as an actor. His family was prominent in the theater. From childhood, he longed for success and fame. But he was overshadowed by his older brother, who had become a successful Broadway playwright, William DeMille. His little brother, Cecil, of course, tagged along, and he was not so successful. In fact, he was really a failure in everything. He tried, but the two men wrote plays together, and um, Cecil acted in a lot of them. David Belasco is a great impresario for whom William wrote such plays as the Warrens of Virginia. Cecil played a young part in it, and there was a child in it, 15-year-old Canadian girl named Gladys Smith, who changed her name to Mary Pickford, and that was her first job in the New York theater. A few years later, they worked together in Hollywood. Mary Pickford was the number one star. And DeMille had been transformed from a minor actor into director general of famous plays Lasky. He was one of the few directors to work in partnership with the producers, the men who controlled the money. With Adolf Zuko, he founded the company which became Paramount Pictures. DeMille was a pioneer and, at this stage of his career, a brilliant artist. In 1915, his film The Cheat was hailed as a masterpiece. Starring Sesu Hayakawa and Fanny Ward, The Cheat was about a society woman who borrows money from a wealthy Japanese in return for favors she then refuses to grant. The Cheat was a success. His other serious films failed at the box office. Disappointed, DeMille decided to give audiences what they wanted. They seemed obsessed with the lifestyle of the wealthy. DeMille let them peer into a fantasy world, the chambermaid's idea of glamour, as he put it. influence in the pictures was felt around the world. He changed the architecture of, of bathrooms in every country in the world. Every architect in the world copied DeMille's bathrooms, those with perfume, you know, and all the things they had for Gloria Swanson and all. And the pictures have that kind of an effect on people. Audiences looked to DeMille for ideas on everything from fashion to interior design. Fashions had once taken years to cross the nation. DeMille's fashions, however ludicrous, were copied or adapted at once. Gloria Swanson became the most imitated woman in America. Women endured agonies to grace their feet with shoes like these. DeMille aided the rise of the cosmetic industry. A bottle of perfume in a DeMille picture caused sales to soar overnight. B.B. Daniels in Why Change Your Wife. To keep pace with himself, DeMille had to exaggerate more and more.
DeMille needed no big names for his films. He was the star. By the early 20s, he was, with Pickford and Chaplin, one of the three biggest attractions at the box office. Cecil, you see, put on such a figure as big director, big producer. He was always one of the three musketeers. He was always appearing at the King's Court. Everything he did was the grand manner. It was operatic, and um, he loved the opera. He loved ballet, too, as a matter of fact. The Cinderella scene from Forbidden Fruit. DeMille modeled his office on David Belasco's. Belasco had once stolen a play written by DeMille. He'd never forgotten. And I think Cecil's revenge was just to take the entire image out to Hollywood and do it better out there. It had vaulted beams like a church, and it had bare rugs on the floor and a light that was fixed on the victim, I was about to say, the interviewee and made him very uncomfortable while the mastermind sat back in the shadows and studied what was going on. He, he was sort of naughty about that whole thing because he had a light like your hot light that was right behind his desk and it'd be there and, and he'd, he'd say, come in and, and sit down and they'd sit in the chair and he'd reach up and turn that light right around in their face so they couldn't see him. He's sitting back in the dark and he started an interview with, with them with a the hot light on him. He used to get actors and actresses so nerve-stricken on the set, I've heard him tongue-lash a woman to the point where it just was, almost was brutal. I mean, literally, truly brutal, so that men wanted to speak to him and, and stop him. Then he'd get her shaking, crying. Then he felt he'd reached the depths. Of course, he'd reached hysteria. I don't know whether that had anything to do with the part or the scene, but he could use it. felt that an actor or actress, if they could stand the gaff, if they could stand the gauntlet that he set up, then they had a great deal of, of courage and uh, strength. Gloria Swanson was one, for instance. She had courage. She had strength. There is a lot she doesn't have as an actress, which I think uh, is important, but she had the qualities he wanted. <laughs> DeMille ordered Swanson to do a shipwreck scene, even though he knew she couldn't swim and had a horror of the water. he said to an actor who said to Mr. DeMille, just how do you, I, should I do this scene when you show me what you want? He said, I'm not running a school. I hired you as an actor. Act. When you're wrong, I'll tell you so. And this was the greatest thing because 
he allowed his actors to have their own personality and to try things out. If anyone came near me to suggest anything, he'd throw them right off the set. DeMille took a delight in creating stars. Swanson was his most successful pupil. He called her with male pride, young fella. He'd always watch me because when I came on a new set, we had a new setup. I would familiarize myself with it if it was my home, and I'd fix the cushions and the magazines and make it look lived in. And then he'd say to me, um, young fella, now when you do that in the scene, when you were walking around, you did something with the telephone and the telephone cord. Do that again. And I, sometimes I didn't even remember what I'd done. But that's the way he, he treated me. Swanson left to star on her own. DeMille replaced her with Leatrice Joy. I had some photographs taken, my first sexy photograph. These were the pictures that Mr. DeMille saw, and he said, uh, very flattering, if my mother could only hear it, he said, a lady with sex, which I thought was a nice thing for him to say. But he did send me up to the wardrobe, and he told them to put me in one of the, the Swanson gowns and just dressed me up, you know, as a very wealthy society woman. And, oh, my dear, it was all crystal and beads and uh, very decollete. And the back went all the way down to my waist. And I walked in slowly, you see, very slowly. And he was impressed. He thought I could carry on the Swanson attitude towards clothes and be the well-known clothes horse. Leatrice Joy starred in Manslaughter, the start of a new phase in DeMille's career. The Hayes office was discouraging the sex and sadism he was famous for. DeMille decided that if they wanted sermons, he would give them sermons, fully illustrated. In Manslaughter, he compared the morals of modern youth to orgies in ancient Rome. I think he was filming his own daydreams. He really did like voluptuous young women. He really did like them all rolling around in these beds. And he had been raised differently, and his wife had, Constance Adams. And he'd come of quite a different background. He didn't have it himself, but I think he dallied in the thoughts of it and thought it was enormously attractive. I think it's extraordinary, but then I'm not a man, you see. I don't know, maybe men like that sort of thing. Women rolling around bulls. Then he finally hit on the formula of extreme religious fervor and uh, interest in God with extreme sexuality. And it, of course, it's almost um, irreplaceable as a combo. Jacqueline Logan played Mary Magdalene in DeMille's most popular film, The King of Kings. DeMille worked well within the studio system, but even he clashed with the producers. Adolf Zukor bitterly opposed his extravagance on the Ten Commandments.
The budget exceeded a million. But DeMille was vindicated. The Ten Commandments grossed over four million. As you look at his pictures, the old pictures, I think they are miraculous when they say he's marvelous with crowd scenes. What does that mean? It means that everybody is doing something intelligent and something different. There's a great vivacity and liveliness and invention right through it, the way there is naturally with people. They fall into natural groups, and this takes an enormous amount of skill. The climax of the Ten Commandments, the parting of the Red Sea. The Red Sea had been parted only once before, and there was no record of how it was done. DeMille ordered special effects man Roy Pomeroy to achieve the miracle. Everybody was trained when they worked with him. Ann Borkins was a script girl, and he always, he, he always used to work with uh, time scenes and then he had a little speaker that he used to speak and he'd just put that out like that and he'd let go of it and if Ann wasn't there to catch it it'd fall on the floor and she'd get held that just followed him with the chair. That was me. Just followed with the chair. And when he sat down, that chair better be there. <laughs> and he had such discipline on the set, working on the Ten Commandments, and they had a scene out in the ocean. And he was looking for a shot, and he looked through his finder, and he walked towards the water, Mitch Lyson and Ann, and Hezzy Tate, his assistant, and all the people, and they, there were about eight of them. And he started walking, he walked out into the surf, and all eight of them went right with him, up to his waist, and he's still looking. And they're all up to their waist, and they got had not a damn thing to do with finding. He's just looking, but they all, he might put out his hand. <laughs> I wasn't there because he didn't need a chair. The bellway was 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 perfection it had to be perfection it may be it might have been a mistake but it had to be a perfect mistake Paper. Ready now? By the time right. sound arrived, DeMille had done his best work. Places, everybody. This is a tank. Where's the set? Right? Camera. But he carried on in the same tradition. A cast of thousands, a budget of millions, a profit greater than either. If one filmmaker symbolized Hollywood, it was Cecil B. DeMille. All right, cut. How is it? The most uncompromising director in Hollywood, and the most self-destructive. Eric von Stroheim was one of the few legitimate geniuses of the early silent days. He was a man of such vision and 
he was so great a poet and an artist that he had found nothing but trouble in Hollywood. <laughs> Eric von Stroheim was one of the few directors to act in many of his own films. Well, he did a lot of things in those days that nobody else put on the screen. Like in the wedding march, there's a lot of stories of getting the whole bunch of people on the set drunk and keeping them there for three days and having nearly orgies on the set. He had girls, and he didn't use any extras. He, he used Pensionnaire of Madame Francis, which was a real McCoy as far as girls of ill repute. Von Stroheim began as an actor at the studio of D.W. Griffith. During World War I, he worked for Griffith as military advisor and played a Prussian officer. A role that fitted him so perfectly, he played it for the duration. From the moment he appeared on the screen, Stroheim had enormous impact. He reveled in being outrageous. He believed his press releases. The man you love to hate. He thought hate was more important than anything else. One girl said to me one day, um, does he drag you around the house by your hair every morning before he goes to work? And of course, I thought that was absolutely ridiculous because he was a very kind person. As an actor, Stroheim was always offering suggestions to the directors he worked with. This sequence contains the first hint of the Stroheim touch. A tiny detail symbolizes the corruption of innocence. Stroheim wrote a script for his first film as director. With a determination some saw as arrogance, he took it straight to the head of Universal Studios, Carl Lemley. Mr. Lemley said, if I give you a chance to direct the picture, when you become successful, you leave me and go somewhere else. He said, I'll shake hands on that and promise you I will stay with you. So he said, um, all right, what's the deal? So Lemley said, you give us the story for nothing, you direct the picture for nothing, but we'll pay you $200 a week to star in it. This was the first time in films, said Strohan, that a man casually followed his sexual bent. Having seen me only as a brutal German officer, the public greatly resented me and the sophistication of my seduction. This man with his dirty sex stuff should be deported, they said. I became infamous and notorious. The picture was made for $42,000. And it made one of the first pictures to make over a million. The people were lined up for blocks to see it. Stroheim was rewarded with complete freedom to direct and star in Foolish Wives. The sets were on the scale of a Griffith epic. Universal City became Monte Carlo. Stroheim's films were always scrupulously authentic. He was fascinated with military detail and his uniforms were correct to the last tunic button. Man was a tremendous stickler for detail. If things weren't exactly the way he wanted, he wouldn't shoot. Uh, uh, at, at the time when he had rebuilt parts of the casino of Monte Carlo, absolutely to every detail. And when he came in to shoot the first day in the hall of the hotel, he suddenly walked over to the porter's uh, little 
desk there, and he looked at uh, the box where the numbers of the rooms showed up when, when somebody rang, and it didn't work. And he said, this, why, why doesn't this work? Numbers must show up. And I said, well, Mr. Winstrom, you're so far away. I will not shoot until this is all set. Everything had to be to, in absolute working order. Stroheim used every arc light Universal had. Lights had to be rented from other studios. The front office ordered him to stop. He had shot enough for three pictures. Stroheim ignored the order. The studio made the best of a bad job. As the cost climbed, they put it up in lights. Finally, producer Irving Thalberg ordered the cameras to be seized. After 13 months, shooting stopped. After the gala premiere in New York, Universal felt the picture was far too long. They slashed it by an hour. Despite an outcry that the film was an insult to the American people, they kept the most provocative scenes. Stroheim and the wife of the American ambassador shelter from a storm in a goat herd's hut. in film was quite uh, atrocious but he had such charm and such innate modesty actually with all of his his exhibitionism and no matter how wicked he was in the films people adored him Stroheim's films were bringing in a fortune for Universal Pictures Thorberg gave approval for his next project, Merry-Go-Round, but warned him against unnecessary extravagance. He served champagne and caviar, and by God, it had to be real champagne and real caviar. I know that was quite a bone of contention at the studio that upset Thorberg at the time terribly that there were bills for hundreds of dollars worth of caviar being served. Uh, usually they would have uh, some jam that took the place of caviar, but not Van Stroheim. Solberg decided that Stroheim's extravagance was inexcusable. He fired him. It was a milestone in the annals of the industry. Now the producer was in charge, not the director. June Mathis, creative head of Goldwyn Studios, disagreed. She believed that the director should have total control. She opposed the factory system and welcomed Stroheim. Stroheim saw an opportunity at Goldwyn to make the film of his dreams. He'd always wanted to film the brutally realistic novel McTeague by Frank Norris. He called it Greed. Here he demonstrates a scene to actor Jean Herschelt. He photographed the book practically from cover to cover and everything but the preface and, a, and a, a sub story of a couple of dogs and it was very truthfully portrayed and put on the screen even to the locations stroheim's use of location was revolutionary for this doomed love story he filmed in real houses real streets I felt the public had tired of the cinematic chocolate eclairs which had been stuffed down their throats, he said. I was going to people my scenes with real men and women who conquered their passions or were conquered by them. His attention to detail surpasses that of any director I have ever known or heard about. His sense of drama is absolutely exquisite. He will build to his climax, he will reach that climax, 
and he will let that climax subside only to be taken up by another wave. It's like the rollers coming in from a heavy storm. Greed. A wife wins a lottery and becomes obsessed with hoarding the money. her husband, McTeague, penniless. Zezu Pitts had been a comedienne. Stroheim tested her for the leading role. He wanted her to age with the story, but to start as an innocent young girl. Zezu was supposed to count the money, gold pieces, and Stroheim wanted her to have an expression as if she had an orgasm and she didn't know what he was talking about. So the funny thing is, he was trying to show her how to do it by mimic him. And, uh, and we, of course, the whole company laughed, but he got his test all right and she got the job. At the end of the film, McTeague has murdered his wife, taken the money, and fled to Death Valley to escape the law. Strohan decided that Death Valley was the only place where you would like to shoot the picture. Because that was the only spot where he could find a piece of flat desert that would be so warm that you could see the, the air go up and ripple over the sand. So we went and uh, the first day temperature was 125. cameras were protected with covers that were soaked in water and that water would evaporate in about five minutes but it kept the magazines cool and Stroheim he had a very funny get up he was dressed in uh, shorts he had uh, yellow gloves and he really thought he was on the Sahara Desert One of our cooks died, and two or three people got very sick. I didn't wait to get sick. I said, you better send me home. McTeague's jealous friend, played by Gene Hersholt, has been made deputy sheriff and comes to arrest him. Stroheim yelled at us, recalled Hersholt, fight, fight. Try to hate each other as you both hate me. And that typified Vaughn. To get realism, he would make you hate him. Stroheim's version of greed lasted 42 reels. To show greed in its entirety would take 
all afternoon and all evening and it would be a long afternoon and a long evening and it would exhaust any audience. He knew he was making a masterpiece. Every scene showed it. He knew that he was making a financial flop because the extreme length prohibited being shown in any theater. And unless the thing is shown in the theater for money and makes money, then it is a failure. No matter how good it is, it's still bad. Now the Goldwyn Company merged with Metro and Mayer, an event which devastated both the film and Stroheim's career. Two men dedicated to the factory system now controlled the company, Irving Thalberg and Louis B. Mayer. Thalberg insisted on greed being cut from 42 reels to 10. Stroheim was appalled. A critic who saw the full version described it as the greatest film he had ever seen, but Thorberg's cuts were made. Carefully plotted motivations were removed, and with them sequences of beauty and power. Stroheim refused to look at the final result. The man who cut my film, he said, had nothing on his mind but a hat. Stroheim was now just another contract director at MGM. He clashed with the front office again over his next film, The Merry Widow. He hated the star system, but was obliged to work with Mae Murray, the most temperamental star of them all. Despite furious rows, he turned in a film which was highly profitable for the studio. He loathed it. He marched out of MGM. He was flawed by living the character he portrayed a great deal, too. He, uh, he didn't have the saving grace of uh, the Anglo-Saxon common sense, to put it bluntly. And... Uh, he was always on, and he was always uh, uh, against the management, <laughs> wherever he was. It didn't matter. And he was going to wreck them. If they thought they had suffered before, he was going to show them real suffering. Backed by an independent producer, Stroheim embarked on the wedding march. Again, he shot enough for two films, only one of which was ever shown in the United States. Once again, he was taken off the production. Why did he do it? There's only one answer, and I can't guarantee it. But it is an inward impression that somewhere early in his life, he was visited by such very great humiliation, such deep, inward, psychic wounds, that there came in him an insane desire to use his genius as a weapon, and that he would use the beauty of his work as bait to make them put out thousands then hundreds of thousands, then millions, and more millions, until he had a beautiful, magnificent monstrosity that is worthless except as a curiosity piece. And he had his vengeance. He proved his genius, and he had his revenge all at one fell swoop. Stroheim had one more chance. Gloria Swanson hired him to direct Queen Kelly. Joseph Kennedy backed it, but no matter how much money he poured in, Stroheim spent more. We worked from 7.30 in the morning until 3 in the morning every night for seven months. And on Saturday, 
he would say, now let's celebrate, tomorrow is Sunday. I said, what do you mean, tomorrow is Sunday? Today is Sunday. And he had a big uh, flask, about a gallon flask, and he would get my whole crew drunk. Claudius Swanson played an orphan, abducted from a convent by Prince Wolfram, who cannot face his marriage to the crazed and jealous queen, played by Sina Owen. gone way over budget and we had 20,000 feet that had to be cut down to 3,000. So, and what he started to do in this, the last part of the picture, not the last part, but the middle of the picture, the second third of it, was I knew censorable. Because in the script it said a dance hall. And by the time he got through and I looked at the rushes and everybody else did, they said, this is no dance hall. This is something else. These sequences were cut from the film and never shown. Ali Marshall was playing a very strange African owner of a place of ill repute, and he was going to marry Swanson, who was supposed to be a girl about 18. And uh, he had one of those safari jackets and in one pocket full of a lot of cigars, and the other one a bottle of cognac. In another part was a gun, and he was chewing tobacco. All of a sudden, tobacco spit <laughs> ran down on, uh, on his chin, and it fell on Swanson's hand. And she said, Mr. Marshall, and he said, I'm sorry, Miss Swanson, this is what Mr. First Lorheim wanted. So I walked off the set and said, no more shooting. And she went to the phone and called the powers to be, I think she called Mr. Kennedy in, in Florida. He was our producer. And uh, 10 minutes later, Kennedy called Strawham and fired it. And that was the end of Strawham and Queen Kelly. Queen Kelly was never shown in the United States. Stroheim's career as a director came to an end. After an attempt to make a sound film, he resorted to acting and eventually exiled himself to France. Lights! In 1949, he returned. He was cast opposite Gloria Swanson, playing a failed silent film director. Where am I? This is the staircase of the palace. Oh, 
All right. Cameras. As he lay dying, Stroheim told his biographer, this is not the worst. The worst is that they stole 25 years of my life. <laughs>